And again, I just want to say welcome. I, I think the longer that I take up air on this planet and the longer that I get to be uh, a part of this church, uh, the, the more grateful I become for you guys. Uh, you are such a wonderful, wonderful family, and I'm so grateful for you. And uh, I'm also grateful that uh, and ask for grace this morning. Uh, my voice is gone. Uh, I, um, I was asked on Thursday to preach at the men's conference that started Friday. And so uh, I, my voice uh, is a little uh, gone and, uh, and, and just sore from the weekend. David the, writes a psalm where he says, God, I'm exhausted, in essence, from worshiping you. Like, I'm so worn out from exalting and praising you. And I felt that this morning. Like, it was kind of running through my head. Like, I just sat in my chair where I had my quiet time like this. And uh, so this morning, I, I, I asked Joy, I said, hey, where's the ibuprofen? And she laughed, and she said, you're going to be running on the Holy Spirit and ibuprofen this morning. <laughs> and uh, that's true, actually. So uh, that's, that's the reality for me this morning. So I appreciate you just guys. You're giving me grace this morning. Uh, it was such an awesome, awesome time uh, with those men. I'm so grateful for that weekend and for what God is, is going to do in the lives of men uh, because of this weekend. So I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 9. We're still in this chapter where Jesus is laying out, in essence, just how awesome he actually is. And um, I want to ask you a question that I want you to answer in your mind. Because I know a lot of you, uh, you have had a leader in your life before, or maybe you have a leader or a boss now. So You've worked under someone and uh, within a company or a farm or whatever it is or, or whatever type setup, at least one time in your life you have had a leader that you've had to work for. And the question that I want to ask you is what is one of the most important characteristics of that leader? So if you could, you could in essence draw up what type of leader is leading your company, your business, your, your farm, whatever it is, what would you put on that list? What characteristics would you want that leader to possess? And I want you to truly answer it in your mind. Like, what are some of the things that you would want that leader to have? Maybe it's uh, even within the family. What type of leader do we want within our marriage and, and within that relationship? Um, a lot of really significant research sources have asked the same question. Matter of fact, Forbes most recently uh, has put out an article asking the question to thousands of employees, what is the most important characteristics for a leader to possess? Uh, Harvard Business School did the same thing, asked the same question, and within the last couple of years have published their work. I was reading through that work uh, the last, this, this last week as I was preparing for today. And do you know what's on both of those lists and more lists that I found from past history from decades before? There's many characteristics, vision, passion, all those things are on it. But do you know consistently across the board, Harvard Business School, Forbes Magazine, all of these other publications, you know what's at the very top of the list? Humility. They want humble leaders. I just want to ask just for interest. How many of you that was on your list that you kind of drew up in your mind right then? Not many. Okay, y'all need to start reading some more Forbes magazine, okay? <laughs> yeah, okay, but some of you, some of you for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's not like one right answer, but there's not a person on the planet who works for a leader that's like, you know what, I really want a prideful leader. Like that just, that would really bless me is for someone to just be super arrogant and just do what he wants to do or she wants to do all the time. No, everyone would say, I want a humble leader. Yeah. And so what we're going to see today, again, chapter nine of, of Mark is Jesus revealing his awesomeness. You know, he's already been transfigured. He's already done some really awesome things. And now he's going to give us a glimpse of what humility actually looks like. And so for us today, this lesson is so vital. It was so key for the disciples, and it's also so important for us. Because if we want to claim that we follow Jesus, it's pretty important that we look like Jesus. And so Jesus today is giving us a life lesson on what is the source of humility and what does it look like. 
Because honestly, instead of me trying to define humility, you know, I mean, you've heard other definitions, uh, thinking less of yourself, you know, thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That's a very popular definition of humility. There's others that you could probably conjure up or Google. But instead of actually trying to define humility, I want to show it to you. I actually want Jesus to show it to you. And so today, this morning, we're going to look at the source, the genuine, the real source of humility And then what does it actually look like? What does it look like within your marriage when you are humble? What does it look like within this church? Because I'm going to just go ahead and share with you something that Jesus is wanting his followers to powerfully understand. That the church will fail, Christianity will flop, if the people of God are not humble. That's so crucial for us to understand. This church will dry up and die. If the leadership and the people in this church start getting prideful, start getting arrogant, start saying, well, I want to do it this way, or I don't like that we're doing that, or look at what that church is doing down the road. Why are we doing that? That is the beginning of our death. And that's not my opinion. That's Jesus's truth. So this morning, we're going to see the source and what humility actually looks like from this passage, beginning in verse 30. So if you want to see your marriage and your family and your corporation, your business, and this church succeed, and I'm going to invite you to join me in this passage of Scripture, this leadership lesson from Jesus that if we miss, we miss health. So join me in this passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 30 of chapter 9. From there, they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them. So Jesus is again about to teach them a, a significant lesson about humility, but we don't really realize it's about humility yet. He says, the Son of Man, that's himself, is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house he began to question them what were you discussing on the way because apparently the disciples were having a little discussion a little bit further back from Jesus on their hike what were you guys talking about he's asking them he knew what they were talking about verse 34 but they kept silent For on the way, they had discussed with one another which one of them, listen to this, was the greatest. They didn't say anything. You parents who have kids in the room, how often? What's going on? What are y'all doing? We know when a bedroom gets quiet with one of our children, it's not good. Not good. Something, something, especially with our third one. (laughs) That dude... He's, he's, he's building a fire back there in his room. So they get quiet. They don't say anything. Let's dive back in. Because he knew what they were talking about. So sitting down, he, he called them, verse 35 to 12. And he said to them, if any one of you wants to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them. And talking, taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me, which is the Father. And in the last section here, that Jesus is the school of leadership for Jesus. And John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. My friends, let's pray together as we, as we understand and then apply Jesus' lessons on humility. Let's pray together. Father, I confess that my heart is bent towards pride, self-centeredness and selfishness. And so, Father, I I confess that before you, before our people, and I confess that as people, we, we often are more concerned about ourselves. 
And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would help us to be humble, not so that we can have something to brag about, but so that we can display you to each other and to the world. What the last thing lost people want, Father, is arrogant, prideful, stuck-in-their-ways Christians. And so, Father, I pray that that would die today in our hearts and that, Father, we would continue to be a people of genuine gospel humility. And I pray that if someone has not yet humbled their heart and prayed in repentance and faith to receive Jesus, that today would be the day that they humble themselves and come to Christ and be born again. And that your church, we would grow in humility. It would not be something we arrive at. It would be something we constantly pursue. And I pray all these things in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to see. The first truth that Jesus is going to teach us about leadership, and if we miss it, we miss all of it. Because you and I can fake humility for a while. You know, if we're in a good mood, we just had our coffee, whatever else. Like, we can fake humility, but if we don't have a genuine source of humility, it's going to fall flat. It's going to fall apart. The genuine source of humility is the gospel. The gospel is the source of true humility. How do we know that? Because before Jesus begins to teach his his disciples about servant leadership, he gives them another precursor to the gospel. What does he say? The son of man must be delivered. He's going to be betrayed. They're going to kill him. And when he's been killed, here's the beautiful part of it. Three days later, he's going to come back to life. And my friends, that's the gospel. Don't overcomplicate it. The gospel is not a music style. The gospel is that Jesus Christ loved you so intensely, wanted to buy you back from the claims of the enemy, that he went to the cross, ingested all of your sins, every single one of them, past, present, and future, hung on the cross until he declared it is finished, is buried, and then destroys death for all of us by resurrecting from the grave so that now no longer sin or death has victory over humanity. The source of humility is us having a bigger view of the gospel, that we were not worth God dying for, and yet we cost Christ for God to buy us back. That in itself must be the the source of humility. Why? For two reasons. One, because it's Jesus who's saying it. Jesus, according to Ephesians 2, or excuse me, Philippians 2, had everything. And Philippians 2 says, and yet he humbled himself, was born in a manger, went to the cross, did not come to be served, but to serve. You and I have, we can get so misguided in our thinking when we start feeling entitled and yet claim to be Christians because the most entitled human on the planet, Jesus himself, who is the only one who has the right to say, yeah, I want to do it my way, and is completely justified in that, did not come to say, all right, everybody give me what I want, do what I want. No, he said, I want to come and serve you. I'm going to serve you because of Jesus himself. But second reason why the gospel points us to humility is because you and I can do nothing to save ourselves. Nothing. There is not one of us in this room that can go to a cross and hang there, bleed and die, and we will stay in a coffin. And our blood is tainted. You and I are the recipients of this most extreme and extravagant love. We have been the recipients of the most humble leader who will ever exist. And if you want your marriage to thrive, the gospel has to be at the centerpiece. When your children sin against you, the gospel has to be at the centerpiece. When your spouse does you wrong, When the gospel is not at the very center, well, then it's like, how dare you sin against me, disrespect me, not appreciate me. But when the gospel is at the centerpiece of your heart, I'm going to speak to the men, just to the men for a second. When your wife, every decade, disrespects you, once every decade, 
and sins against you, your ability to forgive her is not because of how great you are, but you are reminded that your wife could sin against you a thousand times a day for the next 100 years and she would not even get close to the tab that you and I racked up before God. And so when she does that, we can look at her and say, hey, that hurt. I love you, though. I love you. And don't say I forgive you because you're like, forgive me for what? <laughs> and she'll probably be right. But it's the same thing for wives. When your husbands aren't fulfilling their duty that you think they should be doing as a husband or a father, whatever else, you know that you have a king. You have a husband with a capital H who cares more about your kids than you do, who is more concerned about your home than you are. When the gospel no longer is the driving force and the centerpiece of our souls, you and I get real prideful real quick. Real prideful. So the gospel is the source of true humility. There's a story about a, uh, a, a man from Africa who took his nephew on a hunting trip out in the bush. And they went out there and, you know, typically were gone for a few days, but they were gone for a lot longer. And so the tribe began to be worried, and they sent men from the tribe out to find this uncle and his nephew. And they wander into the bush, and they find the nephew. And he's standing about, about knee-deep in a pit of quicksand. And so the tribe, they, you know, they, 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 they get him out. They, however they do, they, they pull him out of this pit. And they ask the, the nephew, where is your uncle? And you know what the nephew says? I was standing on his shoulders. I was standing on his shoulders. My friends, that's you and I. We are standing on the shoulders of Jesus' sacrifice for us. How dare we think ever and act out of pride and self-centeredness because you and I can stand before God one day because Jesus gave everything for us. We are standing on the shoulders of a crucified Christ. Let us never, ever be prideful. So that's the source of true humility. It's Jesus. It's the gospel. So then, therefore, what does it look like? What does it look like when you and I actually operate out of humility? Well, Jesus tells us, they go back in, that this, this next truth or what it looks like for us to be humble. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coining this phrase gospel humility because the gospel, again, has to be connected to humility. And so gospel humility, here's the first thing that it does. Here's what it looks like. It elevates others. It elevates others as opposed to promoting yourself because pride is about you. Gospel humility, though, is about elevating other people. Look, we go back into this story. How do we, how do we see that? Because it says that the disciples were discussing on the way. They were in an argument. And what was their argument? Oh, I'm greater than you. I'm so, oh, I'm so much greater than you. Did you see Jesus the way he looked at me the other day? Psh, I'm totally his favorite disciple, for sure. I went up on the mountain with him, transfiguration. You didn't even go. You didn't even go, bro. You, you even, I, I'm so much closer to him. We're friends, man. We text back and forth. We're super tight. You're not the greatest. He rebuked you the other day. He called you Satan, Peter. Really? You think you're the greatest? Yeah, but he said sorry later. You know, like, like they're just, how, I don't know how this looked, but they're arguing with who is the greatest. Who does Jesus love the most? Who's going to sit at the right hand of God? They're arguing. Who's better? And Jesus tells them, hey, listen, what were you guys talking about? Oh, man, man, look, uh, we just, you know, nothing, 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 nothing. He knows everything. He knows our hearts. And you always know that it's Jesus because he always opens with a question. What are you talking about? Nobody said anything. Everybody gets quiet. And he teaches them a lesson. He says, hey, listen, gives them some very sound leadership truth. He sits them down and he says, if any one of you wants to be first, you want to be great, you want to have status and, and, and everyone look at you? You want to be great? You want to be first? Let me tell you the secret to that. Here it is. 
Gentlemen, listen, come, 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 come. Come here, come here, come here. If you want to be first, be last. Be last. Let everyone else go before you. Make sure everyone else is fed before you are. Serve others first, and then you will be first. Die to yourself is what he says in other passages of Scripture. And then he gives them an, an object lesson here. He brings a child up, and he says, listen, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And you may be like, well, that's really cool. He's promoting VBS, and that rightly is so. He loves children. Jesus loves kids. We say that multiple times in the Gospels where he's celebrating children. But that's not what he's meaning completely. See, a child in that day, they, they weren't viewed the same way they are now. Like for in our culture, uh, our culture to a large degree is a child-based culture. So it's like whatever sport our kids are playing, whatever thing that they're doing, our whole family gravitates around that, gravitates around the children's activities. And I wanted to make a quick note about that, that when your family operates around the schedule of your child, what do you think that is subconsciously communicating to your child in the most important years of their life as they're developing their worldview? What are they thinking? Life revolves around me. It is okay to tell your children, no, we're not doing that. And we, we package it as like this, like, oh, I'm, so, I'm such a noble parent. But what you, and you are, I don't want to take that away from you. You guys are, are, are wearing yourselves out to serve your kids. You're doing an incredible job at that. It's amazing what you're doing. But you also need to consider, what am I communicating to them? What am I communicating to my child when everything that we do revolves around what they want to do? And so with Jesus, he, he takes this child because in their day, children weren't seen that way. Children, because of diseases and different things, like they were, they were not as valued as they were then. They were, they were kind of like property almost until they got of age. And then it was like, okay, now we've, we've got the air, we've got everything else. But they loved their kids. We just, they didn't view them the same way we do. And so what Jesus is doing is he's bringing this ch child here and he's saying, in essence, what he's saying is, this is the least in our community. No one else in our community is is less thought of, in essence, as this child. And what Jesus is saying is, this helpless and needy person, these are the people that you serve. Not the people of status or authority, the people who have nothing, who need everything. Those are the people that you serve. What Jesus is opening up the bar for is that if I'm supposed to be serving them, I actually need to be serving everyone. Because if he's communicating that the lowest of the lows in our culture should be the people that I'm serving, well, then I should be serving everyone. And Jesus is like going, uh-huh, now you're getting it, yep. See, gospel humility, it, it elevates others, not promotes yourself. There's a really great quote from uh, Danny Aiken, who kind of summarizes this section. I, I think I have it on the screen, but if not, I want to read it anyway. But what in essence Jesus is saying is treat well those who have no standing in this world. Children, lepers, AIDS victims, the mentally impaired, the physically disabled, the aged, and you will receive an audience with my Father. That's what Jesus is saying. You make yourself last by serving the least and you are the greatest in the kingdom of God. Elevate others, not yourself. Not who is the greatest, but how can I most greatly serve? It's the first lesson on humility. That's what it looks like. When you elevate others, not to diminish yourself, but to point them to Jesus. Here's the second truth about what it actually looks like what gospel humility looks like. Not only does it elevate others, but here's the second thing. It celebrates others. It celebrates others. How do we see that? Well, they go on a little bit further. This is so perfect. Jesus just like, just like lesson stacks all of these little leadership lessons. Because then they keep going, and they saw somebody casting out a demon. They were, he was casting out a demon in Jesus' name. And the disciples, again, were like, whoa, 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 bro. That's my job. That's what we do. 
who are you? Who are you? And it says that not only did they question him, it says they commanded him to stop. Hey, you're not with us. You're not a part of what we're doing. Stop. See, pride competes with other people. Humility celebrates them, but pride competes with them. How often do you look at someone who is kind of equivalent to you in your career or maybe even in your, in, in, for moms looking at other moms or, or dads looking at other dads or people who are in different companies who kind of have the same role as you do? Let me get even more personal and real. Looking at other churches. Oh, look, look at their worship style. Oh, wow. Our worship style is so much better. How dare they worship Jesus that way? Look at what they wear on Sundays. Look, look at uh, what they have on the platform. Or look at what they don't have. Look at this, this meager. It's just, you're, when you're constantly looking horizontal and you're competing, you are operating from pride. And that happens everywhere. Matter of fact, I want to take a, a, a pastoral moment to share with you that I hear that in the whisperings of this church itself. In the last three weeks that we've been in here, I've heard murmuring, murmuring among our people. Why are we doing it like this now? Why are we having it like that now? Why why is this happening? Why is that happening? Competing, comparing. I don't like that. I don't like that we're doing that. I don't like that we've done it this way or that way. You know what that's operating from? Me. I don't like this. Where's the source of it? Me. And I'm going to share something with you on a very personal real note. Murmuring within this body will do nothing but destroy your reputation and the unity of this church. When you and I start operating from, well, look what they're doing. Look how they're doing it. Look how that's going. Look how this is happening. Look how they're doing this now. When you and I start operating from that, we're just like the disciples. Jesus, tell them to stop. They don't need to worship like that, Jesus. They don't need to have this on the stage or that on the platform or that church didn't need to build this or that church didn't need to do that. Tell them to stop, Jesus. Humility, it celebrates other people. It celebrates what God is doing. Pride compares, competes, judges. And I'm going to tell you something. I will not, by the grace and help of God, tolerate this body being destroyed because our people started murmuring. Now, does that, mean, does that mean that we don't need to have criticisms? No. You have something that you see, something that we need to maybe be engaged in, bring that up. Bring it up. But don't spew it out. That's a great leadership principle. You have a problem? Take it up. Who's above you? Take it up. Don't take it out. That applies to Everybody. Man, there would be workplaces in this room that would literally change Monday if some of the employees that are sitting in this room would stop spewing gossip and slander and their opinions all throughout the workplace and would just go to the leader and say, hey, help me understand this, or why do we need to do this, or how can I help make this better? Literally, work cultures tomorrow morning would drastically change, and it would take it even personal, and homes would drastically change today if husbands quit being negative and critical about everything else in their life, or wives quit comparing and got off of Instagram and quit looking at everybody else saying, Jesus, tell them to stop. Gospel humility can have an opinion, but it ultimately celebrates other people. That's what Jesus says. Hey, listen, don't stop him. I know what he's doing. I know what he's doing. And listen, he's for us. 
Just because he's not in this doesn't mean that I can't be still working there. Listen, just because someone's not a member of this church doesn't mean that they're a part of some anti-Jesus movement. Just because they worship differently or do things differently, and the same goes for us. It celebrates other people. Let me tell you a really cool story of how this happened. There's a young lady named Sarah Katolsky who played softball for Western Oregon State. And so she's playing softball against Central Washington. So a few years ago, they're engaged in a softball game. And this young lady, Sarah, goes yard. She cranks one. That, she hit a home run, okay? She hit a home run, sorry. She hit a home run. And so she's so pumped, as she should be, and she's like, yeah, yeah. And her, in her excitement, she misses first base. So she keeps going, and her coach is like, whoa, 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 hey, come back, touch the base. And so when she pivots and turns, she literally blows out her ACL. I know all the moms are like, oh, oh, I know it's sad. It's like, oh no, well, here's the rules. Okay. You hit a home run, but you don't touch all the bases and go home. Guess what? It does not count. Now everybody in the stadium is like, oh, come on. Just she literally tore race. They'll give her a chance. The coach could not pick her up and her own players could not pick her up to take her to all those bases. So she's literally laying in the middle or between first and second base, screaming, crying with a torn ACL and the Western, their central Washington players are just like, what do we do? They did nothing, except for one of them, the first baseman. Her name was Mallory Holtman. And Mallory went to the umpire and said, can I pick her up and carry her to all the bases? And he had to go back to the rule book And he said, actually, yes, you can, as an opposing player, carry that that girl all the way around the bases. You know what Mallory did? She got a couple of her teammates. They basket carried her to every base all the way home, all the way home. It's so awesome. And when I read that story, there's a little... Uh, Devo that, that Gray and I read together at nights uh, that some good friends of ours right over there gave to us, super grateful for that. And when I read that story, I teared up because I thought that is what we are supposed to look like. There's no reason why that young lady should have picked her up. She's against her. <laughs> that point meant that she was one point closer to losing that game. And yet her and her teammates didn't care. I think that's what Jesus was talking about. If Jesus would have been around in that day, he's like, hey, guys, let me get on YouTube real quick and show you, show you a clip of what it looks like to actually be humble and to stop competing with each other and comparing with each other. That's a nasty hobby, and it's anti-gospel. Because if Jesus worked that way with us, he would have said, yeah, I'm not going down there for them. Are you kidding me, God? Seriously? He didn't operate like that. He operated off a totally different mindset. So gospel humility, it celebrates others, it elevates others. And lastly, gospel humility serves others. It serves others. So after Jesus had told this story about this this young man that they were trying to rebuke, verse 41, it says, he gives an object lesson again. For whoever, 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 whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, thank you, babe, I hear you over there. Because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. A cup of water would have been a very insignificant thing. And he says, here's the deal. The smallest, this is, this is what Jesus is trying to communicate. You serve the least of these with the children and also even the smallest things that you do for the kingdom in my name, I will not forget and you won't lose your reward. Someone out there this morning is literally doing this. Here you go. Here you go. Do you know what's happening in heaven right now? It's coffee, Ethan, but we should probably be drinking more water, probably. What is happening 
is every time, every time that that spigot drops and that cup is handed, Jesus is saying, ching, ching, ching. Every person who held a door open this morning, I got you, I see you. Even a smile that you give to a stranger as they were walking in here this morning. I saw that. I saw that. Every prayer that you whispered this morning as you're driving here, as you sat here, I saw that. I see that. You will not lose your reward for even the most insignificant acts of kindness when they are done in the name of Jesus. That's so incredible. So I'm going to invite the band. I love, there's, there's a, there's a uh, David Brainard is a, is a missionary, and he, he makes this statement that I think just perfectly captures. There's two statements I want to read to you guys, but here's what he said. This needs to be like our motto. This was my prayer this week as I came across this. Uh, Pastor Chuck shared with me a, a really great resource and super grateful for him and how he serves our church. Chuck is a quiet leader, but he serves this church so earnestly and quietly, and I'm so grateful for him. And so he, he shared with me his book. Yeah, we can celebrate Pastor Chuck. And so the first quote that I want to share with you, I hope it's on the screen, it's that it is sweet, this missionary says, it is sweet to be nothing. You have that on the, oh yeah, good, 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 good. It is sweet to be nothing and less than nothing that Christ may be all in all. Isn't that so opposite of what the world says? Make yourself great. Build your platform. Expand your brand. And what this author is saying, what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 no. It is so sweet. It is so awesome. It is so incredible when we are nothing. <laughs> and you know what? Not even nothing. Less than nothing. So that Christ can be all in all. My friends, if you want to see your family thrive, if you want to see this church grow three and four times more than it is currently, it will happen when you and I operate off a basis of humility everywhere we go. And I love that we got this from the men's conference. John Tyson shared this, and I just want to drop this on you guys because it like rocked my world. It was until the church can throw a better party than the world, we have nothing yet to say. And so what I want us to be a church of is not, oh, he ought not do that. He just raised his hand. Mm, I don't like that. Oh, my goodness. They are playing instruments in here. Oh, God's not pleased with that. No. What I want our church to be is when you come here, you're like, dude. That rap car and start that I went to in high school has nothing on what Jesus is doing in us. Heaven, heaven is not going to be this eternal boredom. Heaven is going to be a feast, a party. And so... Humility, gospel humility, it serves other people, but pride, it serves self. And so my friends, I want to ask you the question, who are you elevating right now? Who are you celebrating right now? And who are you serving? Is it you? Or is it others? You want to be a great leader? Be a servant. We got a lot of awesome servants in this church. Phenomenal. The men in this church, insane. Men from all over the country came here, met and saw our men sweating tirelessly all weekend to serve them, and they were like, dude, what are y'all serving in the water down here? <laughs> like, these men are so selfless. And then, I don't just want to brag on the men, and then we get to the catfish dinner, and they walk into the smorgasbord of sugar. <laughs> there is literally, there's two rows of diabetes for everyone. And these guys from LA, these guys from Minnesota, they were like, 
this is amazing. It's like, dude, our ladies are a different level of awesome. They know, they know how to take sugar and point you to the Savior, my friend. They know, they know the secret. And so here's my, here's my encouragement for us during this invitation, right now, in this moment, is that if you've been operating out of pride, self-centeredness, self-seekingness, here's the deal. You don't have to keep doing that. Like this morning, under the grand view of the gospel and what Jesus has done for you, you can operate on a totally new basis, a totally new system. And so some of you this morning doing this invitation, you may just need to come forward and say, God, I, I confess my pride. I've been so entitled and so critical and so opinionated because I'm operating off of pride and not humility. I've lost sight, God, of what you've done for me in Christ. And so you just repent this morning, joyfully repent. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Will you leave here with the grace of God in your humility? Or will you leave here with the opposition of God? That's a powerful truth. Pride will walk out of here with opposition between you and God. Humility will gain his grace and favor. So what are you going to leave here with this morning? And for some of you, you have not yet tasted the gospel. You know it, but you have not received it. And so today is the day where you can repent and believe in Jesus Christ and be born again. Church membership is not going to get you there. Praying is not going to get you there. Bible reading is not going to get you there. But repenting and believing in Christ when he is continuing to pull you to himself will cause you to be born again. Have you repented and believed in Christ? If you haven't, there's people all here, pastors will be here, and all you need to know to say is, I'm ready to know Christ. I want to know that type of leader, a servant leader who died for me. I want to know him. I don't want to know about him anymore. So this morning, I want to invite you just to respond to Jesus, not to my sermon or to me, but to Christ. This morning, by Eric and the band, selflessly lead us selflessly lead us, you respond with selflessness before Christ. Let's pray.